Hi and welcome to this, the very first episode of Land Rovers Live. I'm your host Matt Cooper and with me co-host Jeremy Spencer. That's right, we're the Land Rover Nutters who twice a month will bring you everything exciting to do with Land Rovers. That's right, so every other Thursday going out on YouTube and Next Eye Internet Television we'll be bringing you a show packed with features, news, reviews and generally what's going on in the world of Land Rovers. So this weekend we're launching our show in great fanfare at the Billing Land Rover Festival. Jeremy, what, what are we going to see at Land Rover for the show? Well, it's the biggest Land Rover Festival in Europe, I think. I so we're so. going to see a lot of Land Rovers, Land Rover bits, broken Land Rovers, very big Land Rovers, and a whole range of exciting Land Rover products. And we're putting a studio right in the heart of the show. So we'll be chatting with the people who are bringing out the latest products. We'll be testing, well, whatever we can get our hands on, really. And we'll bring you some great features along the way. So on today's show, we're going to look at uh, well, a few new products that we've been uh, having yep. around the office. We've got that great stove, uh, we've got some nice little bits you can add to your Land Rover, a roof rack and a cuddy box. Well, let's go on straight ahead and have a look what we've got in this week's product reviews. For more places to stash things and to add a modern touch to your older Defender, Mud have this, the Mud Defender Tunnel Tray. This fits LT77 and R380 Defenders. We really like the small details on this. The finish and patterning of the plastic tray is identical to that on your Defender Dash. It's thin, but it really doesn't feel that way. The tunnel tray features two cup holders with foam pads in the bottom to further ensure against spillage on the go. This version has a coin or pen tray either side, but you can opt to have up to three 12 volt sockets and three USB ports also. Fitting this tunnel tray is a fairly simple affair. First up, fit the rubber strip provided to the base. We do recommend a drop of glue at intervals along the rubber strip to ensure it does stay in place. We also found that trimming the rubber in place is made for a better fit around the screw holes. Next up, and you'll need a drill here to provide the two fixing holes. We use a 7.5mm drill. These holes should match well up to the two screws that sit on the top of the transfer box casing. If you've got matting or carpet you can drill through these, but if you prefer we found that the new screws provided went straight through without making a mess of things. Once the two screws are fitted, you're pretty well done. The fit around the stick gaiters is good, and considering the tunnel tray is only fixed at the rear, it does stay rather well put. We loaded it up and took it for a spin down some bumpy lanes. All in all, we really like the Mud Defender tunnel tray. It's a great simple addition to your Defender that gives you a bit extra, or allows you to repurpose your cubby box cup holders for switches. These are available now for £41 or about $60 by clicking on the link below or going to mudstuff.co.uk. Every trekker needs topping up with regular food and a hot cup of tea when out in the wild, but for most of us in frequent campers, a little gas stove will suffice. But I won't deny that nothing beats a real fire for a focal point around a cosy campfire. Portable log burners are a neat and easy way to get around the petty restrictions in place to protect us from the idiots. But armed with one of these, you can stand in line with the bunny huggers as well. Of course, being landed people with spare time and around to it, Many of us could fashion a perfectly decent log burner from an old gas cylinder. There are plenty of ideas on YouTube. So what could you expect to spend on such a facility? We spend the weekend with two stoves made by Ainway in Cornwall. The Traveller stove, which for the basic product costs £375, and their much-loved Frontier stove, which starts at £150. The Traveller is a pretty posh setup, a mini version of a log burner you might see in a country sitting room, but with some design extras to make it into a decent stove. You can even order it with a range of colours if your standards of glamping calls for colour coordination. You can spend as much as £500 on the Traveller, but for that you get the drop-on hot plates for the sides, the safety tray, full 4-inch flue for the flashing kit so you can install the chimney through the tent or cabin roof, while the safety tray protects your Persian rug. The more muscular construction not only makes for a more aesthetically pleasing stove, it also means that you can burn coal and stay cosy in your ute well into the next ice age. On the other side of the design, the Frontier gives away its origins as a humanitarian aid product. The Frontier stove entered service as a lifesaver product, designed to be used in disaster zones, and it can still be seen in operation around the globe, and at Land Rover shows, of course. The Frontier stove is more cooker than heater, but neither role is significantly compromised by the ingenious design, which allows the entire thing to be packed within itself and then into a bag. They will sell you a decent bag for the stove for an extra £20. Backed up, the kit weighs a little over £20 and takes less space than a large tent, all compact enough to be always on hand. Portability means using much lighter materials, but as with a bigger stove, safety first seems to be inherent in the design. The legs slot 
and pin into place and are splayed to give a steady work surface all at a reasonably safe height. Sure, it's a small firebox to accept small sticks and twigs, but it's easy to light and not too greedy to feed, with the sort of material you'll find lying around on the woodland floor. The manufacturers claim, and we have no argument with it, that the frontier stove is ten times more efficient than an open fire, and of course the smoke is carried well clear of the fire itself. The flue, with extra cash, can reach seven feet or so, and as with the traveller, you can spend a little extra more and install the stove in your tent or hut. But the clear advantage of the frontier is its portability. That and the kettle. I confess that when we unpack the stove and completely ignore the instructions on how to properly cure the paint before use, I thought that the £90 kettle was a bit of a joke, but not at all. It proved to be extremely useful. There was always hot water for the washing up or making tea, and for me, it proved to be the most delightful feature of all. The Frontier demands a little more maintenance. The narrow flue will need regular checking and cleaning, and it won't love you for being left to rust. But for £240 with the kettle, it's money well spent, and a gift that will last her for years. Both products are available now from Anive at anive.co.uk or by clicking the link below. Roof racks. There is a lot of choice in the market, and finding out which one best suits your needs can be a bit of a minefield. British manufacturers Masai have joined the roof rack party in style with a full range of roof racks for all occasions. This one is a 90s full length luggage rack at 2.15 meters. Masai roof racks are self-assembly and in the case of this one it took us about 45 minutes to extract all the bits and pieces from the packaging and protective wrapping. One of the great things about assembling your own roof rack is that you notice the attention to detail in Masai's work. All the nuts and bolts are stainless steel so will last longer than the vehicle it's bolted to. As well as that, underneath the black powder coating of the roof rack's components, they're zinc plated to keep them free from rust. Once unpacked, assembly took us about 40 minutes and the instructions were pretty clear. When mounting this rack onto your vehicle, we recommend using some of the packing strips or some rubber on the six gutter clamps. We didn't and we made a bit of a mess. Once assembled and fitted, the Masai luggage rack performs well as expected. There are plenty of places to attach straps to keep your goods on board. It looks the part and generally offers all that you need from a luggage rack. The Masai roof rack is available now in all its derivatives for Defenders and Discoveries 1 and 2 by visiting the Masai website or clicking the link below. I do love that stove. Always the hot water for the washing up. And if you've got any ideas for things you think we should review, please get in touch with us on the Twitter or through Facebook. And soon, right now in fact, we're going to head over to M&M to see what Matt's doing on the Land Rover for the workshop guides. I think he's changing a prop shaft, but I can't be sure. So in today's show, we're uh, back here at M&M with Rich, and we're going to replace the prop shaft on this thing. So, when you choose prop shafts, there's a whole host of different prop shafts to talk about. Uh, Rich has produced three here for us to have a look at. Uh, so what have we got here, Rich? Well, here on our left, we've got a standard prop shaft. Uh, in the middle, we've got a wide angle prop shaft. And over here on the right, we have a double carden prop shaft. Okay. So, so most people, if we've not modified it before, will, will have something like this on, on their vehicles. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, these are pretty reliable pretty good all-round prop shafts. Yeah. When might we run into trouble with these or when, or when might we say we're not going to replace it with a standard prop shaft? Um, well obviously they'll wear out like, like other things on the vehicle and if they're not greased properly they can wear out because of that just through wear and tear but one thing that will take a prop shaft out prematurely is if the vehicle is lifted, it's got a suspension lift on it and then these are working at an angle that they shouldn't be working at and then they can fail and then at that point you may want to consider putting an aftermarket prop shaft on it. Okay, so, so in terms of what, when we put in a lift on a vehicle, a standard height, they, we're never going to have any problems with a standard prop shaft. What sort of lift could, do we think we can go up to before we say, right, that's, that's not enough? Um, you, should get a, you should be fine with uh, a two inch, up to a two inch lift with a standard prop shaft, um, but any more than that, you know, you really should be changing it for something that's, that's made for the job. Right, so, and something that's made for the job might be this wide angle one we've got in the middle. Yeah, um, wide angle one um, is good for, I mean, this vehicle here's got a, a five inch lift on it and, and this is the one that we're going to be fitting to it. Um, we could opt for this one, but because we want more articulation, this one will give that over this one. 
Um, the double carbon one is more designed for a smoother drive. When you're going, if you're doing a lot of road use and you've got a lifted vehicle, th this would be a good choice to go for. But if you just want sure axle drop, then I'd go for the wide angle one. Okay, uh, you loosely touched on the double carbon there. These double carbon uh, prop shafts, they didn't start life as a modified Defender part, no, right? No, it's, um, it's, a, it's a factory um, Discovery TD5 prop shaft, uh, which is fitted to the front of the Discovery TD5. Um, uh, and it was, again, it was designed for a smoother ride with less vibration in the front prop. Makes sense. So we spoke about wide angle and standard, uh, what does that actually mean to us when we, we talk about articulation, but where does that come from, because they're pretty rigid bits of metal. Basically all it means is the, the amount that this flange will, will rotate on the end of the prop shaft. Mm. Um, if we just put them on the ground in the same manner and lean them back together, you should see that this one will come back further than that one will. Yeah, so, so we can see on the standard one, well, the, the wide angle is sort of dropping back another, well, two or three inches at the top. Yeah. And I guess that's where, where our lift kits are going to benefit. Exactly, yeah. Okay. Right, so that's a decision made. Then we're going with the wide angle on this Defender. Okay. Right, let's get started. Cool. So we've got the Defender up in the air to get the new prop shafts on. Now, Rich, ordinarily, would this be a one-man job or would... Because we're cheating a bit here, aren't we? We've got Nick up in there who's going to be pressing the brakes and in, engaging the diff. Yeah, I mean, you could do it on your own. I mean, if the, if the vehicle's on, on the floor, you, you know, it, it makes life a little bit more difficult because you've got to keep jacking the car up to turn the prop shaft over. Failing that, you could be pushing the car forward, but it means having to keep getting up and getting the handbrake on and off. So two people always make life easier. Um, but yeah, you can do it on your own, no problem at all. Right, well we've got the vehicle up in the air now, so you can get cracking. Awesome. Once you've got the vehicle safely up in the air, we will loosen the four nuts and bolts on each flange of the prop shaft. These can be very tight or rusted up, and it really helps to have the correct spatter here. 14mm will do at times, 9 16 is really what we want. Now that the fixings are loose, we're using an air spanner to remove the nuts from the transfer box end first. You can continue using either spanners or a socket here. I'll take the back ones off first because the back ones have got studs. So the nuts can come off there and the prop doesn't drop. So start with the back. What I, I, I slackened them all off just, just to start with so I could use the air tool. Uh, done the backs first, like I said, so that stays where it is. But these are nuts and bolts. So once these come out, obviously that just drops. Yeah. So I've left one in to make sure it doesn't drop on me. Uh, we're just on the last one now. So then when that comes out, I've just got to take that one there just as a safety precaution. If you're working underneath your vehicle, the front end of the prop shaft dropping could easily break your nose, so take okay. care here. So that one's out, so take the last one out. Now sometimes they can stick because obviously they're bare metal surfaces, um, so they can, they, they can sometimes sort of get welded onto each other, so you sometimes have to give it a tap. In this instance it's not, so it's come off fine. Whether this side will or not is another story. No, it's fine, it's popped off, but you can see that they will go a bit rusty, which is why they kind of stick into the surface. But if you give them a bit of a jar, they usually come off. If, you, if you're replacing the prop, obviously you can be a bit more brutal with it. If you're putting it back on, then it's a good idea to perhaps give it a, a, a tap with a soft mallet, not the joint, but the, 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 the flange and that gently. Obviously not too hard on the flange because there is a bearing in there as well. Well, that's the prop shaft off, so grab a cup of tea and then we'll get the new prop shaft fitted. So here's the new prop shaft. When we install it, we make sure that the slider part is at the front of the car, um, and obviously the fixed part is at the back. Uh, but incidentally, the slider part on the rear prop shaft would be the same, but that would be at the front, so the props always face that way with the slider facing forwards. When placing the new prop shaft in place, the transfer box end goes on first as it came off. 
the flange holes are not evenly spaced, so you'll find that they will only go on in the correct orientation. Once the prop shaft's in place, be sure to drop a bolt through one of the holes at the diff end to keep you looking gorgeous. Then refit the nuts and bolts. You should be able to reuse the bolts, but the nylon nuts will want changing each time to ensure that they stay in place. New nuts go on the transfer box end and we're very nearly there. As mentioned earlier, having a helper here is very useful to engage the diff or handbrake in order to rotate the shaft and getting the fixings in, and locking again to tighten them up sufficiently. Alternatively, you only actually need to lift one wheel off the ground to do this because because you've got three diffs in the car, you've got your differentials obviously front and rear, which most people know about. You've actually got a differential in the transfer box, which means if one wheel is off the ground, the prop will turn. So when, you, when you're off-roading and you lose traction with one wheel, you know, people get confused and think, oh, it's four-wheel drive, why is one wheel spinning? It's because the, the, the power is going through the easiest route, which is through the gearbox, through the differential in the transfer box, through the differential in the front axle or the rear axle, and then through the wheel that's lost traction and basically diff lock, again people think it locks the actual differentials, it only locks the centre diff in the transfer box. So power is put to both front and rear wheels all the time and you can still lose traction then by spinning one wheel on the rear axle and one wheel on the front axle. As in the removal, using spanners or ratchets nip the fixings up before using a torque wrench set to 33 newton meters. final lockdown. That's it, we've successfully replaced the prop shaft. It's all running nicely and we're good to go. So there you have it, that's how to renew the prop shaft on your Defender. Now if you have any burning questions or you really can't get that rear A-frame ball joint off, do let us know. Each episode we'll be bringing you new workshop guides to tackle the, well, the issues that you will inevitably have with your Land Rover. So next up, we've got, uh, what's our favourite feature? Land Rover Heroes. Uh, what's Land Rover Heroes about, Jim? Well, it's about the people who use Land Rovers in the front line. The people who are doing some really important work for the community, saving lives, putting out fires, catching the bad guys. And uh, we've used the Land Rovers as an excuse to see, go and see the work that they do. That's it. So obviously, when Land Rovers were first built, they, were, uh, they weren't really designed for Green Lane at the time. It was for, it was for some pretty serious stuff. What's that, Jim? Forestry. Forestry, yeah. yes. Yeah. Killing trees, moving them around. That's right. Um, and obviously there are still plenty of Land Rovers in the field doing that, that very same thing today. So we sent Jeremy off to Rill, to the lifeboat station. Uh, how do we get on there? Excellent. Such a nice bunch of guys. And uh, their Land Rovers much loved and very busy, but it isn't by any means the biggest bit of kit they've got. No, it's not. Let's take a look. All right, we're starting with our Land Rover Heroes here. I'm with Paul Frost, and we're at the Real Lifeboat Station. Paul, you've been here a while, haven't you? I have, yes. Well, I first started here when I was uh, 14 years of age. Uh, we weren't really allowed to be on the boat at that time. We couldn't start till 17. But I'm in my 46th year now, so you can tell how, old, how long I've been here now. So long they gave you a medal for it. That's right, yes. <laughs> uh, I, I got my MBE uh, three years ago from the Queen as a thank you for all the work they've done. And also, it's a, it's a nomination for the station for all the hard work that they do as well. It is a very impressive station. And it has some unusual issues with a bit long beach and the soft sand. And that's one of the reasons we ended up here with the Land Rover because a long time ago, I believe you tried a Land Rover that was on tracks. We, di we did try a Land Rover that was on tracks. Uh, we thought it was, would be a very good vehicle for the, for the coastline at Rill, uh, with the long beaches and the soft sand, but unfortunately it just wasn't quite up to the, uh, what we expected of it, and we have reverted now back to the normal Defender Land Rover. And you can't do without Defenders, I understand. You've, they've got to be a part of the RNLI kit. Um, but this is a very standard Land Rover. There's nothing about it remarkable at all. There's nothing remarkable about it at all, apart from the fact that there's such a versatile bit of kit. Uh, the RNLI does modify them for their own ends, but only cosmetically for the blue lights, things like that. But otherwise, they're just bog standard. But they're, they're so versatile in the role that they can do. And what does she do for you? Well, one of the things, because as I said before, we have over a mile to go out to sea, to the shoreline, and because of health and safety, we have to carry crew, but we can't carry them on the boat, so they go in the Land Rover. The other primary role 
is to tow the inshore lifeboat should we have to go on road to any sort of services that's a little bit further away. So you can't cope without your Land Rover. What's the RNLI doing about this sort of the dearth of Land Rovers from 2015? It's, it's such a shame because I say they're, they're such a well-loved vehicle. Uh, what the RNLI are doing is they're taking out all the standard upholstery and everything like that, the matting, and they're replacing it with the galvanised chassis for a start. Basically, any Land Rover now is, is, is expected to have a, possibly up to another 10 years' life left, and this, this particular one is seven years old, and we're hoping that it may, may go on for another 10 years. Galvanised chassis, replacing all the, uh, the foot pads and everything like that with metalwork, and then spraying it in a paint that we can just wash out, and hopefully that'll extend its life. Actually, the RNI and I are very good at getting long time life out of kit, aren't they? We're going to have a bit of a sneak at some of the other things you've done and some of the other kit you use. Now, this is what we all know as the workhorse of the RNLI. This is the inshore lifeboat. Well, so, as you said, this is the workhorse of the RNLI, and particularly in Rill, we have been the busiest station in Wales for five out of the last ten years. And most of it is down to this little beastie here. Uh, we get anything upwards of 100 call outs a year mostly to either children in inflatable dinghies being blown out to sea or people cut off by the tide. Now we, ha we have been out anything up to 10 times in one day with this. It can get quite uh, hectic. The reason you have the, the, the marinized tractor is so that you can get this boat safely launched across the, the, the beach. But the Land Rover, this takes you, gives you other options, doesn't it? The Land Rover gives us a multitude of options, actually, really, because... Uh, we, if, we're, if the tide is really out, we can start off with the tractor because the, the tractor is primarily the main machine to get it out because of the soft sandbanks that we have in Rill that we need to get it over and over quickly. But the Land Rover can follow up with additional crew, anything like that. But the Land Rover is mainly used for us if we have, a, if we have any call-outs into the harbour at low water, where there's still water in the harbour. We ha need the lifeboat to launch, but then we need to go by road. And the tractor is obviously too slow. So the Land Rover is the ideal, ideal resource for us to use that. And uh, what sort of speed can this boat get up to when it's free of its trailer? Normally the speed is something around the late 20 knots, like 30 mile an hour, something like that. I mean, when you're inside this and kneeling down, that's quite fast, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so for the real problem, that the Land Rover isn't going to be sturdy enough to launch a proper lifeboat or even an inshore lifeboat, you need something very substantial, something very meaty, and Paul's going to show me the big launching tractor here. Well, this is, this is our Talus tractor. It's, without this, the lifeboat certainly wouldn't launch, and we wouldn't be able to get anywhere near the sea without anything like this. It's, it's got a 300 horsepower uh, Cat 3208 engine in it. And it's got these, these massive tracks and this huge cab and it looks like an armoured vehicle but actually it goes underwater, doesn't it? It does go underwater, yeah. It is it's actually rated so that uh, we can get it up to the top of the cab, the water. It's watertight up to the top of the cab. The air intake is actually at the top of the cab as well as the exhaust is as well. Normally we run, to launch a lifeboat, between three and four foot of water. And I think you told me before that with this tractor and with your big life, but you can get this whole rig down to the sea at low tide in 20 minutes. Yeah, that's right. We have over a mile to go to the water's edge, uh, and this can take between 20 minutes to half an hour. Uh, when the tide is up, we can still launch within five, 10 minutes. Right, now we've seen the important end of the, the towing operation, but let's go and have a look what it's got to tow. Okay, so we're on board a Mersey class lifeboat, which is the biggest vessel we have here at Rill. What's special about this boat? Uh, well, the Mersey class lifeboat, like you say, it's, it's the biggest class of lifeboat we can get into the station at Rill at the present time. It's actually the smallest of the offshore fleet, but the beauty of the Mersey class, it was intended and designed primarily for launching off a beach, off a carriage, so that to go into the water. We've got about 25 stations around the coast of these, so it is quite a specialised unit, but they're ideally suited to what they were built for. Oh, this boat's 20 years old. Uh, well, 22 years 22 old. 22 years old. 22 yeah. years old. And uh, she's still going strong, still looks trim and fit. Uh, how many rescues has the boat done now? Well, I couldn't give you the total for what we've done. We, we started off in 1992 with this boat, and we've been consistently averaging 20 call outs a year with it. This is on top of the normal exercises we have, two a month. So it, it's just quite, quite a long time. Uh, we are expecting the lifetime of this to be well into the 25 years plus. So Paul, what type of work do you expect this boat to do? 
Uh, obviously, this being a, a more larger boat, we would expect to be called out to larger types of incidents, uh, such as yachts, if they can't uh, make any passage through the water or they're dismasted or something like that, small fishing boats that have broken down. Uh, RIL, at the moment, has had quite an increase in the leisure industry, which has resulted in many, many small leisure boats coming out fishing off these areas, and by nature that some do get into difficulty. Well, so really, as, as rills become busier and nature of the work around rills change, then the nature of the work here has changed as well. Definitely. The, we've, we've seen the nature of the call-outs completely different, whereas this, this boat took a back, back view of, of the number of call-outs we had in the year. We're now coming more and more to the fore. And like I say, we were the busiest station in Wales last year. Yeah, I, I've even been told by someone that people don't know that the RNLI is a charity, which seems extraordinary to me, but it is a charity and it can only function with the goodwill of the public. Uh, we have the shop alongside the lifeboat station which sells souvenirs in aid of the RNLI. The RNLI relies entirely on voluntary contributions, uh, such things as legacies, people leaving money in the wills, and people can locally can help and go onto the RNLI website at www.rnli.org.uk and there is a donation section there if they wish to help that way. And of course if people want to find out about joining the service and playing a full part, um, they can get that information from there as well. And they can keep track on the Twitter account, I believe, of launches from Real. That's right, yes. We, we, we have uh, both Twitter and Facebook accounts. Uh, the Twitter, if you go to see what RNLI lifeboats are out at the time, it's out on a shout. Well, thank you very much, Paul. It's been a real privilege spending a day down here with you and the guys. And uh, if you want to see what the other work's done here, Will, or indeed any other RNLI lifeboat station, look for them on the web, check the links on the page, follow them. Wow, and there was an MBE in there to boot. Now, uh, I hear Jeremy that uh, his mother, she's got one as well. Yeah, well, Paul was very modest about his MBE, and I think it was because he didn't want to find out that his mother got hers first. Yes, in fact, I'm sure he doesn't live down. No, not quickly. But they were a great bunch of guys. They thoroughly enjoyed the day there, and obviously the work they do is brilliant. And so just a quick reminder, the, the Twitter, you can follow all of their shouts? Yeah, they've got a... Uh, on a shout, I think it is. Out, out on, a, on a shout. Out on a shout. Out on a shout. And uh, if you follow that, you can find out when they're launching and saving people and doing all sorts of things. Strikes me though, like yesterday they were at five times. Beautiful day. So I wouldn't say they were fair weather like both of them. Never. No. It's a pretty easy job for those volunteers. I oh reckon. my God! <laughs> You're going to drill again. <laughs> So we'll be, we'll be bringing you a lot more Land Rover Heroes in the future, but for this show, that's about it. It is. If you want to get in touch with us, let us know if you've got any problems with your Land Rover, or we'll do a workshop guide about it. There's also tons of competitions. Just let us know generally what you think about the show. The information is on the screen below to get in touch with us on Facebook and or Twitter. But for now, Jem, I think that's it. We'd better get off to billing. And we will. Shoot off now.